Thank you so much for inviting me. I'm excited to have a slightly different audience for, for this work. I've been working on this project with um, building designers and ventilation specialists. Um, and while that is interest, very interesting, it gives me a totally different perspective. Um, I'm really keen to see what the people that this uh, research might actually be useful for think. Um, so I'm an associate professor in environmental engineering. I'm actually an environmental microbiologist. I work at the Civil Environmental and Geomatic Engineering at UCL, which is based in the main quad in the Chadwick building. In there, um, I have a lab with a big environmental chamber, which is where I did the work that I'm going to show you. So this project is part of a bigger project called AirBods. Um, which stands for Airborne Infection Reduction for Building Operations and Design for SARS-CoV-2. Um, it was uh, one of the UKRI COVID-19 projects, um, and it had it, the project consists of a number of different tasks. So the first one, task one, is the work that I'm um, doing with a couple of colleagues. So this is experimental work looking at what happens with aerosols and droplets within a space in the real world. So task two is all about computational simulations. So all sorts of weird and wonderful and extremely complex uh, simulations of air flows and concentrations of particles and this bit and that bit and so on, um, as well as some risk transmission, sorry, transmission risk models as well. Um, task three was some field studies. So we have the opportunity to <laughs> go and sample some weird and wonderful places um, in 2021, including Wembley Stadium and we got to go to the Brits, which was my first night out in about two years. Um, swabbing toilets, wonderful, uh, and, and other places. And then the last one, the last task is about developing on the basis of all these things that we have learned through experiments and uh, modeling and field studies, can we distill something useful from it for uh, built environment professionals, so the people that design these buildings or that maintain them. Um, so that's a bit about the project, but I'm really just going to talk about um, task one, which is the experimental work. Um, so this is the walk-in um, environmental chamber that we have at Civil Engineering. It is pretty controlled. Uh, it can, we can vary the humidity from 30% to 70% of relative humidity, the temperature from 15 to 40 degrees C, and then we can have either no air changes at all, five air changes per hour or 12. Um, there are some ceiling fans that you can see up there in the picture. So these mix the air inside the room. Um, so we can have just changes of air or we can have changes of air and mixing. Um, as a little aside, the mixing is more than you would get from a normal air conditioner, which is in an attempt to try to make the entire chamber uniform but you wouldn't get that sort of level of mixing in a normal room and you know it would be blowing in your face and uncomfortable uh, and I, i'm sort of saying that because it explains some of the results that you see and uh, there's a single steel door it has lights uh, and it's 43 meters cubed in the volume so it's something like four by four by two and then some two and a half ish Okay, so what did we do in here? We were, so we were trying to determine the impact of ventilation, so different types of ventilation strategies. So they're um, shown up there, so either nothing, so no new air, no mixing plans at all, uh, then just uh, then just ventilation itself, so the changing of the air. And then our third method was changing of the air and mixing of it. Um, and then we were also interested to see what impact parti adding partitions between where with our source of aerosols and our receptor aerosols, um, what impact would the addition of these partitions have on what we're seeing um, with the particles? I hope it's clear so far, please, because I know it's a bit different. Please do ask as I go along. I'm happy to answer questions. Okay, so we standardized our temperature and humidity at 20 degrees C and 50% relative humidity. We were using synthetic saliva um, and we, we used this contraction on the left, which is called a uh, collison nebulizer, um, which basically produces a range of different 
aerosols to droplet sizes. Um, we then tracked these aerosols and droplets. I'm not going to call them aerosols just for ease of having to say aerosols and droplets every time. Um, we tracked their numbers um, over time within the chamber at a couple of different locations. And these were the different sizes that we were looking at. So they're sort of size ring, they're, they're called bins. Uh, so they're, uh, so for example, 0.3 is from 0.3 to 0.5. 0.5 is from 0.5 to just under one, then one to three, three to five, and then the next, there's another one, but uh, they have come out a bit rubbish, I'm afraid. Um, and then, as I said, we perform this under different ventilation um, conditions. Just want to show you a little bit how we set up the chamber. I might be, sit myself here so I can fiddle with this. So this is what the chamber looks like. You come in through here. These are the fans. This uh, in here is where the air comes in, and then this is where it travels out. So we had our source here. Uh, this is our collis and nebulizer, and we had a particle counter just by there. And then we have a particle counter here, which is our what we're calling our receptor, um, about um, which is a, a meter away. We also had another particle counter here by the air outlet to see. We, we're sort of trying to measure an average of what's going on around the room just before um, it goes, just before the air leaves the room. Um, and this is a side view, so it's looking from this wall here. So we have our nebulizer as the source, uh, then our partition here halfway between the source and the, the receptor, which is this particle counter number two. Um, I think that is pretty much all I have to say there, apart from that we had three different sizes of partitions. So we had a small, which was something like between 50 and 55 centimetres squared, uh, the medium, which was about metre by metre, and the large, which was two by two metres. So a pretty chunky thing. Okay. Um, and I just want to give you a little note about data analysis. So this is what an average run would look like. So what happens is... The, we set we set the particle counters going here at minute number well at zero, time zero, um, and then let things settle for a little while, and then this is when the nebulizer is turned on. So then the particle counts start going up, and it takes a little while to get to a sort of steady stage where this line um, sort of straightens out. So what we did was basically take. Um, Instead of, instead of taking all of these measurements where we've got a lot of variability in the numbers of particles, we just stuck to this last chunk of data, which is more of a steady set. And I present, well, we presented that as um, box blocks, which I will show you now. Is, does anyone have any questions on what we were doing? All right, so um, here are the results. So this, uh, this slide shows you the impact of ventilation itself. So there were no partitions used at all at this point. Um, so there are five graphs. For, for the next few slides, there'll always be five graphs like this. So um, they are, so this is for the tiniest aerosols uh, between 0.3 and 0.5 microns, then the next step up, uh, the next step up three microns, and then up to five microns. Um, so the main thing that you can see is that um, when, when everything is off, we've got high, consistently higher numbers across all of the different particle signs, sizes that we're seeing. Then once we turn the ventilation on, so that's these green um, box and whisker plots, you can see that the numbers of all of the different sizes go down some. And then once we introduce mixing on top of the air changes, we're getting even lower numbers. Um, so you can see the, these, these sort of step res reductions with ventilation and mixing of the air. And the other thing that's, that you can see is also that when we um, introduce mixing, the variability in our data is much less. So it's, it's really sort of evening out um, what's going on within the chamber. Okay, and now I'm going to move on to what happened when we added partitions. So this first slide is just looking at no ventilation at all, the impact of just the partitions 
um, with, with still sort of stagnant air within the chamber. Um, so the blue is no partition. The uh, bright orange is a small partition, the 50 by 50 ish one. Then gray is a meter by meter, the medium. And then the large is two by two meters. Um, so with, when you look at these, you can see, first of all, that we have a lot of variability, especially amongst our very small aerosols um, within our data. There's, there's a lot of um, variability in what we're seeing over time, but over the replicate, the replicate runs of our experiments too. Um, when it comes to these uh, particles, so three microns and above, uh, we definitely see a bit of a reduction as a result of the screens. Um, and actually, particularly with the small screen, which was totally not what we were expecting, because, you know, you, we've all seen the tiny screens in various shops and whatever, and thought, what's that going to do? But actually, it turns out if there's no ventilation, it does do something, which is a surprise to me. Um, meanwhile, the medium is, you know, in some cases resulting in higher numbers, which is strange, which I'll attempt to explain shortly. So then this is everything the same again, but this time we've introduced ventilation. So five air changes per hour while we're recording the numbers of particles at the receptor position. Um, so again, blue is no partitions, orange is the small, gray, the medium, and yellow, the large. Um, so we can see in this case, when we just have the changes of air, we are seeing a bit of a reduction um, in numbers of particles uh, when we're looking at these larger ones, the five micron ones, with all of the different screen sizes. But then looking at the other sizes where, um, where the, the particles are a bit smaller, um, there's a bit of a reduction, but it's not as uh, pronounced. And, we, and we're seeing this strange trend where the medium partition seems to be resulting in uh, more particles at the receptor point than with no partition at all, which is a strange thing. Um, the reason we think this is happening is because um, the, the geometry of, it, of the room is 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 specific to that room and the inlet and outlet are at the other side um, of where so I'm trying to explain it very well. Basically, all of the air moving in this case is happening behind the partition, behind our receptor. Um, and we think that what's happening with the medium partition is that it interferes with the air flows within the space in such a way that the particles get whipped around the edges um, of, the, of the one meter partition and end up sort of circling around where our receptor is. And this is where our computational people come in to try to explain this, but that's something I'm still trying to convince them to do for us. Okay, so this was just ventilate, sorry, just air changes, no mixing. And this is with air mixing as well. So we've got air changes and mixing. Um, and again, we've got the no partition, small, um, medium, and large. And in this case, um, we're not really seeing much of an impact when it comes to the large um, droplets aerosols, so down here. So they're pretty much consistent. When, when there's a lot of turbulence within the space, the large particles aren't really impacted. Um, we are seeing some slightly different trends in the smaller particles or aerosols, um, in particular with the, with the large, um, what's the word? The large screen, the large partition is having an impact, having more of an impact there. And again, I think this is to do with the airflow dynamics within the space um, and how the large partition interferes with the airflow dynamics within the space. So the large one actually went all the way from the floor um, almost to the edge, well, to within a meter of the other side of the chamber and then almost about half a meter from the ceiling. So that's a really significant intervention from the point of view of room geometry. Okay, so I'm going to wrap up. Um, so our conclusions, ventilation strategies absolutely have an impact on uh, the numbers of aerosols um, 
and, and the sort of size of distributions too. Um, so we found that just the introduction of five hour changes per hour um, result in reductions from between about 20% um, for the tiny particles to about 53 in the larger. And then when we also introduce air mixing, we're getting much bigger reductions again. So nearly 40% for the tiny um, aerosols and more than 90% for the large droplets. And then when it comes to partitions, um, in the absence of ventilation, they can reduce the numbers of, of aerosols at, at the receptor position. Um, however, th these are much lower than what we were, well, they're lower than what we were seeing with ventilation. So ideally better to ventilate than um, use the partitions. But if you can't ventilate, then partitions might be a good idea. Um, we did see this phenomenon with um, small and large partitions being more effective and the, the medium ones resulting in perhaps more aerosols than we would expect at, at the point of the receptor. Um, and then when, when partitions were used with mixing fans, um, th they didn't really reduce the numbers of particles because there was such good mixing within the space that um, you know, everything was blown around rather than the partition being able to stop much going on. Um, so I guess, what is my take -home? My take home message is, ideally ventilate if you can't, partitions can do something, but it's really important to take into account the geometry of the room and how the ventilation inlets and outlets are placed so that you can then introduce your partition in such a way that it does something useful rather than just messes with, it does what you want it, sorry, it does what you want it to do rather than disturbs the airflows and then you get something weird, like with that medium one where it's whipping things around. Um, so that's it, really. I hope that that was, it's difficult when you know a project inside out to do it justice. I'm more than happy to answer questions and now and later, I just need to say thank you to all the people that actually did the work. Um, so Dr. Rupi Matharu, and Mr. Wai Koch, who basically did all of the experimental work, and then uh, my colleagues on the AirBods team, especially Dr. Abigail Hathaway from the University of Sheffield, who is my co-lead for that particular bit of work. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed. And so I really like to thank you all for being here tonight. Um, I'll run around in the microphone if you have questions. Okay, I've got yes, thank you. Just a quick technical one. You yes. showed um, a very nice presentation. Thank you. Enjoyed um, you showed the scenarios of um, nothing, uh, air change, and air change plus mixing. Um, yes. If you just do mixing on its own, mm -hmm. presumably, is that exactly the same as nothing? Or demonstrate? No, I think it would, it would probably be better than nothing because you would sort of dilute you wouldn't get localized clouds of aerosols. You'd just get one uniform averaged out cloud around the whole space. So actually, I think from a from a transmission point of view, just for example, having just an air conditioner, which would be equivalent to the mixing, means that you would blow potentially infectious aerosols around the space, but their concentration would be lower overall than it would be if somebody was right next to the emitter. So I don't know if that makes sense. Does that make sense? Yeah. A question for you. So in practical terms, so you speak to the this and you go, okay, fine. When you walk into a room in real life, yeah. how, do you, how do you relate that? It's really difficult, isn't it? I think the, I mean, this isn't, you don't need to run environmental chamber experiments to know that if you open a window or make sure that the ventilation is working, it's going to make a difference. Um, but I think it's been quite nice to actually quantify the impact of, of these particular strategies within this particular space. Um, However, there are loads of limitations to it, like, you know, we were looking at just that one configuration with where the air only comes in there, the air only goes out there, we can only mix that speed, blah, blah, blah. Um, and also the Collison doesn't necessarily produce the same uh, size and number distribution that a human does. Um, so while 
it's given us some useful information from a real world point of view. It's not, it's not perfect by any, by any means. So yeah, it's, a, it's, a, it's quite difficult to translate into the real world. And this, the fact that we found that the impact of the screens uh, it will depend on what the room geometry is like. That makes things so much more complicated and, and results in quite a difficult message to get across. You know, we can't just say, oh, well, yeah, if a meter by meter will, will be great anyway. Um, and that's sort of, I don't know, it gets sort of lost in, the detail gets lost and that's mm -hmm. dangerous. Uh, and the particle size, they were quite small. Particles. Very small. <clears throat> yeah, they were all tiny, tiny um, aerosol, aerosol sizes, really. Um, yeah, so we were, I guess we were, because the project is about airborne um, transmission, we were interested in those tiny ones, so below five microns, really. So what what happens to those from the ventilation and screens point of view? And if we think about TV, and I don't know, you might know the answer, to anyone else in the audience. When people cough with TV or breathe with TV, what do they produce? Do you know the sound? Yeah. Uh, I don't. Uh, there's a just there's a whole there's sort of a almost like a histogram of different particles that you produce, and I think it really dep it depends on the respiratory activity, whether it's just breathing or coughing or talking or singing, um, and and then I I guess from an aerosol versus droplet point of view. Um, you know the, the larger the larger droplets, which I guess are more are more likely to will if we extrapolate will contain more bacterial cells or more virus particles in the, in the context of SARS-CoV-2. They drop out quite quickly because of gravity, and it's these tiny ones that we're looking at that remain suspended. But then they're so tiny that you know what? How many? variants what you get even in one of them do you need to be exposed to millions of them even to be exposed to any variants is that really anything to worry about i'm sorry i need to calm down yeah. getting over it's not okay <laughs> <laughs> i thought that was my cue to get off <laughs> the response is that you know, of course the repeat wisdom that i remember reading is that the the infectious TB, not the sample ones that contain one bacteria, which will be uh, one bacteria is a micron. Um, yeah. Five micron particle sounds, sounds just right. Yeah, um, yeah. And there's also, this, um, I, this is what I learned from the fluid dynamicists within the team that, you know, as soon as, as, soon as you breathe out, especially if it's a well ventilated space and, and with mixing, the droplets that you emit. Um, immediately evaporate, well, a lot of the fluid from those evaporates and then they can become, they might have been droplets as they left your mouth, but they didn't become aerosols for the next time it's longer. Um, yeah. Okay. Yes, that was a great idea. I wonder if you can the aerosols Within like, a space. So yeah, in a space, like, uh, let's say, a person comes out and goes, and uh, how long they uh, are in each time they are also. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I know that that work's been done. I don't know exactly what the answer is, and it does depend on how much they emit and what the circumstance, what the environmental conditions of the room are. Within our chamber, um, we've found that 20 minutes to half an hour means that everything is everything seems to fall out of the air. But that's also with ventilation, with the five air changes on. So things either deposit or get sucked out with the ventilation outlet. So uh, it's no, no straight answer, sorry. <laughs> <laughs>